Thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today's lecture, one new lecture of our course on processing in memory systems. And today we are going to continue talking about real world processing in memory architectures. And in particular, we will talk about the Samsung HPMP architecture, which was the first uh, processing in memory architecture announced by uh, Samsung, while one of the major DRAM vendors. Uh, before we go into the details of this Samsung HPMP architecture, let me remind you that in the previous lectures, previous two lectures, we talked about the AppMemP architecture, which, which actually was the uh, first <clears throat> publicly available processing memory architecture. Remember that this architecture consists of uh, PIM enabled DIM modules, and they contain uh, multiple chips. And inside the chips, we have memory arrays and coupled with them. There are DRAM processing units or DPUs that are small in order processors that have uh, exclusive access to uh, the DRAM banks. And here you see another view of this system uh, where you can identify uh, the host CPU that is still connected to some DIMMs of conventional DRAM that work as the main memory and also the PIM enabled memory. And inside the PIM chip, we have um, in the current generation, eight uh, DRAM banks that I'll call MRAM of size 64 megabytes, and then we have the uh, DPU. As you see, this DPU consists of a pipeline of 14 stages, and then it has two SRAM-based memories, one for instructions and the other one for uh, operands, that scratchpad called WRAM. You can go back to our previous lectures if you want to uh, recap on this AppMem theme architecture. We will continue. Uh, we will talk again about AppMem uh, in later lectures about how to program the AppMem system, for example. But if you want to <clears throat> learn more about the research that we did on understanding this uh, theme architecture, you can go to our paper that is available in archive or watch some of the longer uh, talks that uh, we have given before. So now let's um, talk about Samsung HPM PIM that is also called uh, FIM DRAM, or actually, as you'll see in a couple of slides, is um, is called Aquabolt XL. Is that let's say the commercial uh, name of this uh, Samsung HPM PIM or FIM DRAM? Um, as you may remember, because I've shown this slide before, uh, this um, architecture was announced like. Uh, in February to, uh, 2021, it's um, a PIM architecture that is targeted at um, AI applications, especially uh, inference of AI applications. And um, <clears throat> they first, Samsung first published this um, paper uh, in ISSCC conference uh, uh, last year, uh, where they call the way they call it function in memory DRAM or FIM DRAM. And later at ISCA uh, 2021, they uh, presented this other paper that um, it's more comprehensive. It, it talks about the hardware architecture, but also about the software stack um, of this um, uh, film DRAM system. And uh, also in the Hot Chips Symposium last year, they uh, presented the architecture as well um, and with the commercial name Aquabol XL. So we are going to talk about, um, <clears throat> about this architecture with uh, as much detail as we can today. Um, but before we go into the details of the architecture itself, and because of the uh, fact that the architecture builds uh, on HVM memory, we are going to uh, give a little bit of background about HVM memory. So what is HVM is what uh, we call 3D stack memory, which essentially consists of uh, placing different layers of DRAM uh, on top of each other and, um, and on top of a buffer layer. And this buffer layer contains IO circuitry. It contains also circuits for self-test, test and debug, et cetera. Uh, the DRAM layers and the buffer layer communicate through uh, so-called through uh, silicon bias or TSVs. Uh, here in this um, part, uh, in this figure, you can uh, already identify different layers of DRAM that compose an, a stack of HVM memory, and you can also see the buffer die. These um, uh, vertical connections that you uh, see in this part of the figure are the TSVs or through silicon bias. And as you see, the buffer die is connected 
to the host, for example, a processor, a CPU, or a GPU is connected through a silicon interposer that um, essentially allows us to bring the uh, TSVs from the uh, DRAM layers to the host, and this way achieving a very high uh, memory bandwidth. So the buffer layer is connected to a host processor via a silicon interposer, and one HVM2 stack um, comprises, or one HVM2 die comprises four pseudo channels, each with uh, four bank groups. And actually you can uh, see here one of these uh, DRAM dies. Um, uh, it's uh, seen from, from the top uh, where uh, you can identify the different pseudo channels. This would be one of the pseudo channels and the pseudo channel is composed by one, two, three, four bank groups. And if we go uh, inside the bank group, what we will see is four banks, as you see in this part of the figure. <clears throat> we can go even closer and, and take a look at uh, each of the banks individually and inside the banks. And as we also see in uh, other types of DRAM, they are composed by multiple subarrays and, um, and uh, each of the subarrays or the bit lines in each subarray are connected to the sense amplifier to, to uh, uh, together uh, all these sense amplifier uh, compose what we call the local row buffer. We have uh, several more subarrays here. And then to access data from these, sub these subarrays, we use the row decoder and also a col uh, column decoder. And then uh, uh, we, you can also see here the uh, write drivers that are needed when we uh, want to write uh, data into the subarray, into a row of the subarray. And uh, finally, these input output sense amplifiers that we sometimes call as well uh, global row buffer that are used to uh, move data from the subarrays to um, outside or uh, in the, the other way around, the opposite direction. Uh, one um, thing to remark here is that an access transfer, um, uh, so an access to this um, HVM stack uh, brings uh, 256 bits, a data block of 256 bits over four 64 bit bars over one uh, PCH or one pseudo channel. So um, in four cycle, let's say you can read uh, 256 bits from one pseudo channel. And this happens in four bars of uh, 64 bits each. Uh, feel free to stop me anytime. If, I, um, if you have uh, any questions, I will also uh, keep an eye on the uh, chat and uh, in YouTube in case that there are any questions there and I will try to answer all, all uh, questions related to the lecture. So these HVM memories, uh, even though it's uh, expensive, but it has uh, one big advantage is that it provides very high bandwidth, much uh, higher than conventional uh, DDR memories typically. And it has been used for a while in real systems. Actually, NVIDIA GPUs have started to uh, incorporate HVM memory in the uh, Pascal architecture back in 2016. Uh, more recently in 2020, uh, we see this, uh, we, we or NVIDIA released this uh, A100 architecture that uh, also uses HVM2 memory. And actually you can uh, see here the block diagram of the um, A100 architecture and and, um, and you can uh, easily identify here on the sides these uh, one, two, three stacks of HVM2, uh, each of them connected to the GPU through two memory controllers. There are three HVM stacks on this side and another three uh, on the other side. And more recently, actually last week, NVIDIA presented the new architecture, H100, and this one also features HVM memory, but in this case, it's HVM3 memory, is a new standard. Uh, but again, uh, you can, uh, here in the block diagram of the H100, you can identify the memory controllers on the HVM3 uh, stacks. And um, yeah, you can uh, take a closer look at the architecture by reading this post that this um, blog post that you see here at the bottom. Uh, but yeah, this is the, these are the internals of an H100 core where you can identify different functional units like uh, for uh, integer 32 uh, bit operands for, uh, uh, for uh, floating point 32 bit, floating point 64 and so on. You can also see here load store units, uh, special function units, etc. We are going to uh, 
take a look again at, at this um, at the internals of this uh, H100 core uh, in a few slides. And also, um, FPEAs are incorporating HVM memories. Um, we have been doing some work with these uh, FPEAs, with HVM memories. Uh, here at the bottom, you can see the reference of one of our recent papers uh, presented in FPL 2020. It's a um, narrow and accelerator, FPEA based accelerator for um, uh, stencils and for weather prediction modeling. Uh, here in this work, we work with two different uh, FPEAs, one of them uh, using uh, DDR4 memory, the other one using HVM memory, and that's providing uh, significantly higher bandwidth to the FPEA. Here you can find the uh, link to the paper and uh, here a little bit more detail about this narrow accelerator. Uh, in this figure, you can find here the host processor, in this case, a power, uh, IBM power processor connected to the FPEA using the coherent interface uh, CAPI2. And, um, and inside the FPEA, you can see, you can uh, identify here the narrow processing elements uh, with their own uh, on-chip memory. But from there, and using the HVM memory controller, they can access two stacks uh, of HVM2 memory, uh, each of them with 16 pseudo channels. And this is another version of the paper. It's actually a, um, and another version of the paper that uh, includes the um, a study of, uh, of the stencil computation for weather prediction, but also um, uh, another uh, interesting application, bioinformatics uh, application app uh, pre-filter that uh, we also implemented on an FPEA with uh, HVM memory and show uh, pretty interesting results in this paper. Okay, after having introduced uh, HVM memory, let's talk uh, or let's start talking about the uh, FinDRAM. And uh, first of all, uh, what is the key idea in FinDRAM? It's uh, very similar to the key idea in processing in memory. It's essentially bringing computation closer to where the data reside in order to take advantage of uh, higher memory bandwidth and lower latency. And that's important for many important uh, workloads or that's necessary for many important workloads in particular for machine learning and artificial intelligence, in particular for um, inference in machine learning and artificial intelligence that uh, use uh, like, or are based on um, uh, kernels like GEMB, matrix multiple multiplication, that is um, one a routine in the in the uh, in the blast library in, in actually in blast level two and it turns out that uh, these um, 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 linear algebra uh, subroutines in blast <clears throat> as you may know there are three uh, levels of uh, blast blast one blast two and blast three in particular blast one and blast two are uh, highly memory bound in the particular case of GMB, uh, as you know, we are multiplying one matrix by a vector and uh, the typical operation that we do there is the dot product of each row of the matrix multiplied by the vector. Uh, as you can, uh, if you think about the operation, um, what we are doing is uh, accessing, well, we are accessing the vector repeatedly, but we are accessing each row of the matrix just once. And what that means is that we are not reusing the matrix. And that means as well that the cache hierarchy of a, a processor centric system, like a CPU or a GPU is not useful uh, to reduce the latency of access to data and increase the bandwidth. So in these cases, uh, processing in memory solutions can be uh, very promising or can be very useful indeed. And here is where you can see the difference and where you can see why it's possible to exploit much higher bandwidth if we go, if we put the computation closer to memory. In the conventional DRAM, regardless of whether it's a DDR memory or it's a HVM memory, uh, we follow the von Neumann model, right? And as you know, um, what that means is that we access, so for the execution units to access data, we have to go through a narrow um, channel, a, a narrow memory bus that uh, gives us access to uh, the banks um, and at, at, at different times, right? And, and that means that we are, it, it takes, uh, many cycles to access um, data that resides uh, in the banks 
um, and bring it to the execution unit. And also the amount of bandwidth that we can exploit is uh, quite limited. The advantage of processing in memory is that we place computation execution units near or inside memory. And this way we can exploit much more bandwidth and also we can obtain data with much lower latency because we don't have to go through the narrow memory bus. And as you see here in, the, in, in this um, the simple figure where we have uh, like a couple of ranks and each of them is composed by several banks and we have uh, processing elements near each of the banks. So uh, what that means is that we can uh, get data or move data between the processing element and the bank uh, at the same time for all these banks. And that's why we obtain or we achieve much higher bandwidth. So the uh, FIM DRAM or HVM PIM, as you already know, is based on HVM2 memory. This is a stack memory layers or dies of DRAM uh, on top of each other, uh, what Samsung Fox did is um, changing the design of these uh, DRAM layers, at least of some of them, these, uh, some of these DRAM layers, in order to enable uh, uh, compute capabilities, in order to embed compute units inside the layers. And in this um, uh, 3D chip structure here, you can see that there are uh, some layers that are still conventional memory are just for uh, storing data, while other layers are uh, FinDRAM capable. They have, they feature uh, processing elements. And we will go into more details soon, but uh, here you can already see some numbers from the chip specification, like the number of banks, uh, the number of channels, the, the maximum um, throughput that we can obtain, 1.2 teraflops, and also the type of instructions that these architecture supports. As you know already, this is uh, targeted at AI and machine learning, and their most important operations are multiply, uh, addition, and, and multiply, accumulate, and multiply add. So what, this is why um, these are the say most relevant operations, most relevant instructions that the architecture supports. Um, here you can also see, uh, probably you have already seen this uh, slide before as well in a previous lecture. It's a cheap implementation. Uh, here we uh, see one of the DRAM dice uh, uh, from, from the top. And, um, and, and here you can uh, see like the different pseudo channels. So this would be like pseudo channel zero, pseudo channel uh, one. And then inside each of the pseudo channels, we have uh, four banks. Like for example, in, uh, in, 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 in this part um, here, we see the different banks and uh, uh, between the, uh, so in, inside the banks, uh, we have these also these PCU blocks that are the uh, execution units, the processing elements as we will see. And one thing that you can observe as well here is that each PCU block is connected to two banks, bank zero and bank one. How is this different from conventional HVM2 memory? Well, in conventional HVM2 memory, we simply have uh, the banks, uh, like for example, here you see bank zero, bank one, bank two, and uh, in between of the banks, we have the IO control uh, to, uh, to, I mean, to, to, to uh, send the commands to, to the banks and, and access data. And, and here you can, uh, for, for each of the banks, you see the column decoder, you have the input output sense amplifiers here, um, etc. But if you look at the layer of uh, FinDRAM, um, it, for each, uh, for, or for every two banks, we not only have the memory arrays, like here bank zero and bank one, column decoders, uh, input output, uh, sense amplifiers, but also we have this uh, PCU block. And let's go even deeper. Let's start um, uh, learning uh, the internals of this PCU block. Um, but very first, so first of all, let's uh, clarify some of the uh, design goals uh, that um, these um, uh, people from Samsung set. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to support, or for them was important to support uh, DRAM and PIM DRAM mode for versatility. Why is that? Because we want these to uh, still be memory. We want this um, processing in memory, enabled memory to be memory. And, to, um, and, and we want to uh, give users the ability to use it as conventional memory. So that's why uh, it's important to support both modes. 
And also another goal is to, to minimize the engineering cost of redesigning DRAM banks and sub arrays. Keep in mind that DRAM has been optimized for decades and, um, and changing the design very radically would be, uh, wouldn't be uh, very high costs. So it makes sense that they try to change the DRAM design, um, I mean, the, the least uh, as, as possible. Um, and that's why each PIM unit, each PCU, it's at the IO boundary of a bank. Uh, in fact, as we said before, there is one PIM unit for each two banks. And inside each PIM unit, we have 16 uh, floating point units, 16 SIM delays, each of them of 16 bits. So you can already see here that um, these PCUs, these um, processing elements near the banks, these PIM units are SIMD processors or SIMD units uh, composed of 16 lanes. So they can perform 16 operations at the same time and they uh, work on floating point 16 bit operands, as you see. And uh, th th actually, this is like uh, so. So here, um, uh, yeah, we have uh, one of the banks and we have the ping unit. And here you can see like um, a zoom uh, representation of the bank and the and the CMD unit, the PIM unit. Um, there are some registers as well for the CMD units to store intermediate results. Uh, we will talk soon about these registers. And then if you um, check uh, each of these CMD lanes, we can identify some lines coming from the out input output sense amplifiers because they are directly coming, data coming directly from the DRAM cells, from the memory banks. Um, we also have a multiplexer here to decide whether we uh, use the other operand coming from registers or coming from the uh, from the output, right? And, 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 and the output of uh, each of these lanes can go either to register or uh, to the um, uh, right driver to the memory array. <clears throat> um, yeah, you may be probably familiar with CMD processing already. CMD processing is a computing paradigm that is uh, being used in GPUs these days. And that's why I want to very briefly uh, remind you what is CMD processing and very briefly also as well presenting um, the architecture and the programming model of GPUs, which by the way are very much related with uh, these processing in memory proposals because as uh, you may know as well, um, GPUs are essential for uh, neural network training and, and inference uh, these days. So uh, CMD is one of the four classes of computers that uh, Flynn uh, classified in 1966. CSD is single, single operation, uh, single data. When we have, say, a sequential processor, SIMD is when uh, one single instruction operates on multiple data elements. And then we have uh, other, uh, the other two classes are MISD, multiple instruction, single data, and the MIM, the multiple instruction, multiple data. And it's got something closer to a multi-core processor, a multi-processor, a multi-thread processor, right? The CPUs that we have these days. But let's uh, talk a little bit more about the SIMD paradigm. Uh, SIMD essentially exploit, exploits data parallelism. Concurrency uh, arises and simultaneous execution of operations arises for, from performing the same operation on different pieces of data. That's why we call it single instruction, multiple data. And we can see many examples uh, where we, uh, many examples in real workloads where we can exploit data parallelism, we can take advantage of uh, CMD processing. Um, one example could be like um, uh, adjusting the brightness of the pixels in an image. Another example can be performing the dot product of two vectors. Uh, if you think about it, you'll see that there are uh, certain operations, multiplications, for example, that are applied to all the elements of the two vectors, right? And because of that, with one single instruction, we could uh, perform this operation on multiple 
uh, data elements or multiple, ele multiple elements from the vectors. This paradigm, Cindy, is different from uh, data flow uh, um, uh, computers, for example, where uh, concurrency arises from executing different operations in parallel in a data-driven manner. This is more like task-level parallelism instead of data-level parallelism, and also contrast with uh, threat or control parallelism, uh, where concurrency arises from executing different threats of, of control in parallel. This matches more with a multi-core CPU, for example. So Cindy exploit operation level parallelism on different data. It's the same operation or the same instruction applied to different pieces of data. And if we can say that this um, CIMD uh, computing is a, or CIMD processing is a form of instruction level parallelism where the instruction happens to be the same across data. In CIMD processing, we can operate with a single instruction on multiple data elements or e either in time or in a space. Uh, we have multiple processing elements or multiple execution units. We have already seen in the Samsung architecture and exa uh, the, these execution units. I've mentioned that each of the CIMD units contains 16 lanes and in, in, in each of the lanes we have uh, uh, one or more execution units. Um, in CIMD processors, we can talk about a time-space duality. What that, that means is the way that we are exploiting the concurrency and we are um, operating with a single instruction on multiple data elements. We essentially distinguish two main types of uh, CIMD processors. One of them is the array processor where uh, one instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different spaces or different processing elements. And in the vector processor, one instruction operates on multiple data elements in consecutive time steps using the same space. You can see a more clear um, explanation in this slide um, where we compare how a, a certain CIMD uh, program is executed on a uh, array processor and a vector processor. Um, the, the, I mean, this program is pretty simple as you see, but uh, first of all, we have a load instruction, we access memory in particular, we read four elements from array A and place them in a vector register. Uh, then we have an add instruction, then we have a multiply instruction, both use the values stored in the vector registers. And finally, um, we store in the same uh, um, array in memory. How is this executed on the CIMD processors? It depends. So in the array processor, we have four processing elements and these processing element elements are capable of executing different instructions. So in the very first cycle, we can issue the uh, four uh, load operations because we need to load A0, A1, A2, and A3. And we can start um, this load operation for the four elements at the same time, as you see. After having issued this uh, load instruction, we can go to the add instruction, then the multiplication, and finally the store operation. However, if we have a vector processor, what we, we typically have in a vector processor is different units, each of them is specialized on different uh, operations. So this means that loads need to be pipeline. In the very first cycle, we would, we would uh, issue the load for element zero and then for element one. And um, yeah, after, after some time, uh, we have the value A0 that has been accessed with this load zero. So we can start um, executing the addition in the corresponding uh, processing element. And then um, in the next cycle, we issue the next load instruction, load two, um, and so on. So the difference between these two is that in the array processor, we are performing the same operation at the same time, while in the vector processor, we are performing different operations at the same time. So this is the duality time space, as you see. In terms of space, uh, in the array processor, we execute different operations in the same space, while in the vector processor, we execute the same operation in the same space. If you want to learn more about CIMD processing, let me recommend you this lecture from Prof uh, Professor Mutlu uh, delivered in spring 2021. And as I said before, GPUs are uh, good examples of uh, CIMD machines. The only difference with uh, conventional CIMD processors as the ones that we have just described is that uh, these GPUs are not programmed 
using SIND instructions. They are programmed using threads, and that's what we call the single program multiple data programming model, where each thread executes the same code, but operates on different pieces of data. And each thread has its own context. So we can program them as if they, they were CPU threads uh, running on a, on a CPU core. It will be later when the hardware groups these threads into SIMD units that are called warps in NVIDIA uh, terminology or waveform in, in AMD terminology. And these warps composed typically of 32 or 64 threads will be launched and executed onto the hardware as if they were SIMD instructions. So a warp is essentially a SIMD operation formed by the hardware and GPUs are the uh, SIMD processors. And actually, if you take a closer look at the um, H100 core in this case, we can see that they uh, uh, have like uh, all these uh, multiple functional units here that um, uh, are, are like the, 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 the different SIMD lanes of the SIMD processor that the uh, GPUs uh, internally are. And, um, and as you see as well, there are, they have uh, say characteristics from both uh, array processors and vector processors. So same as an array processor, they have uh, uh, replicated units, as you can see here, this int 32 or this uh, FP32 or this uh, FP64 in order to be able to operate on multiple um, uh, data elements or multiple pieces of data at the same time, but also same as a vector processor, they have a specialized units because these units here are for arithmetic operations. Well, for example, these units here are for uh, loading and storing data uh, to or from uh, memory. If you want to learn more about graphics processing units, let me uh, recommend you this lecture uh, that I delivered in uh, the past spring 2021. There will be uh, in this semester also a, a, another GPU lecture, hopefully um, in our digital design and computer architecture course. And more recently, actually last week, uh, in another of our uh, PNS courses, their course on Ethereum Union Systems, I gave a short lecture uh, summarizing, let's say, most uh, important uh, ideas uh, related to SIMD processing and, and GPUs. Okay, let's continue with the system organization of uh, FinDRAM. The PIM units respond to a standard DD, uh, DRAM uh, column commands, either read or write. And that's good because that makes them compliant with the unmodified JEDEC controllers. Keep in mind that Samsung fabricates, uh, um, uh, fabricates memory, right? And in principle, they probably would like that these memories are being used by many different processors from different vendors. So they cannot expect that these processors uh, are going to have, let's say, modified memory controllers to enable processing in memory. So um, one of the things that I like from this um, design is that it can operate without a, a modified uh, memory controller. Um, they execute one white SIMD operation commanded by a pin instruction with deterministic latency in a lockstep manner. We are going to see uh, in a few slides uh, more details about how each of the instructions is executed and what this means, this deterministic latency in a lockstep manner means. Um, as I said before, the pin unit is composed by 16 lanes, so it can operate on 16 operands at the same time. And these operands may come from the input output sense amplifiers of the bank. So they can come directly uh, from the uh, memory cells or they can come from uh, a register or from the uh, result bus. It's uh, more or less what you, what you um, uh, see here on this uh, part of the figure, right? Uh, uh, where, where, where you can see the, um, uh, the, 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 the SIMD lanes and the input operands may come either from the input sense amplifiers, from registers, or directly from the uh, output of the um, uh, FPU of, the, of, the, of this functional unit. Um, 
one thing that we uh, said in the beginning is that the way of um, uh, obtaining or achieving much higher bandwidth in the execution of um, um, operations in a PIM system is exploiting bank level parallelism. We can uh, operate on multiple banks or in all banks at the same time. Uh, that's that one key difference with uh, standard DRAM devices. In standard uh, DRAM devices, we normally access one bank at a time. Um, in this case, in, or in the in the uh, FinDRAM architecture, in the HPMP architecture, it's possible to uh, keep all banks active at the same time. And the good thing of doing that is that we can have the um, all banks being um, accessed by the uh, processing elements, by the PCUs at the same time. Um, so that's why we say that there are different modes of operation um, in this uh, FinDRAM architecture. We have the let's say basic mode of operation that is called single bank mode, uh, where we have like let's say the normal uh, DRAM operation, but um, using a certain input uh, sequence, a sequence of commands, as you see here, activate and pre-charge commands to a certain row in certain banks, we can go to the next mode that is the all bank mode that in principle would uh, allow the processor to access all banks at a time. And from here, um, we can enter the PIM mode by also setting one flag, this PIM of mode set to one that uh, will allow the uh, processing elements, um, um, it, uh, the processing elements here placed uh, near the banks to access all these banks at the same time and thus achieving much higher bandwidth. And in particular, um, for every uh, 16 pseudo channels, the, let's say, um, uh, aggregate memory bandwidth is eight times higher than the memory bandwidth than that the uh, CPU could uh, receive um, or I mean, CPU or GPU or let's say the host processor could receive uh, in the uh, single bank mode. Um, you may be asking yourself why with uh, 16 uh, pseudo channels you get eight times more, it's eight times higher bandwidth and not 16 times higher bandwidth. The key reason for that is that uh, when you perform, uh, so what, what the standard imposes is that when you perform two consecutive accesses to the same bank, um, the latency uh, the, the latency of these two accesses should be twice, or, the, or the, the, the distance in time, the latency in time of these two accesses to, should be twice the latency of a normal access where uh, two normal consecutive accesses that go to uh, different banks. That's uh, essentially the reason is uh, uh, that uh, this is a limitation is imposed by the, the standard. And related to what I mentioned before, one of the uh, interesting things of this architecture is that it doesn't require uh, to modify the memory controller on the host side. And the reason why this is possible is because the uh, HVM memory is uh, extended with an internal theme controller function in memory controller that controls the theme mode without any modification of the host processor hardware or the host processor memory controller. We cannot, we, I'm not going to go into the details of this um, theme controller, but um, here on the right-hand side, you can identify the PCU block. We are going to go into the details of this PCU block in the next slides. You can already see here um, execution units, register file, and this interface unit for the uh, uh, theme controller uh, to uh, communicate uh, commands and also, uh, for example, yeah, to, to send the clock signal uh, to the PCU block. But as you see, this uh, theme controller is simply receiving uh, commands coming from the uh, host processor. This might be activate, pre-charge, read, or write commands. We will see in next slides how these uh, different commands are used to command, to control the execution of instructions um, in the PCU block. But yeah, you can uh, clearly identify uh, here in this internal theme controller, the mode controller for even bank, for odd bank. Remember that each PCU is connected to um, two banks. We also have this bank address decoder and the 
clock divider that divides by four the main clock of the HVM memory to provide um, the required uh, clock signal to the PCU blocks. Okay, let's go deeper into the programmable uh, computing unit. Um, in the programmable computing unit, in this figure here, we can already identify different blocks. The first of them is this control unit, is an instruction sequence manager. We are going to see soon how um, this um, instruction sequence manager, um, uh, like, say, orchestrates the execution of instructions here. Um, you can already uh, identify this even bank interface for the PCU to access the even numbered bank and the odd bank interface for the same reason to access the odd bank. And here we also have these green blocks uh, represent registers. So we are going to talk about these registers in more detail, but there are, as you see, some um, general register file that is uh, for operands. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and also we have uh, two more, let's say register files. One of them is for commands, is this CRF, and the other one is for constants, this SRF. And then uh, here in the, in the middle, you see the uh, floating point units uh, multiply and add. Uh, even though you cannot identify them in detail, this uh, PCO block is, uh, um, it's a, a pipeline I mean, contains, or it's a, implemented using a pipeline of five stages. In the first stage, uh, it's a decode, so fetch instruction and decode uh, the instruction. In the uh, second stage, uh, we can uh, read data from memory. We load 256 uh, bits of data from the even or the on bank. We say that this stage is optional because not all the instructions need to access data from memory. As you'll see, there are some multiplication or some addition or some multiplication and accumulation instructions that directly use operands that have been previously um, uh, stored in the in the register files. So they may not need to access um, data from from uh, the um, cell arrays themselves. Then we have two more stages. One is for multiplication, and the other one is for the addition. This is the important. This is important for instructions where we want to execute one multiplication and one addition, or one multiplication and one accumulation operation. And finally, uh, right back to the uh, general register file. It's uh, the last step in the pipeline. Um, here we see the uh, internals of the PCU block in a little bit more detail. Uh, observe the uh, interface unit uh, to uh, control data flow, this interface unit that interfaces the programmable computing block uh, with the uh, theme controller that we saw um, in a previous slide. We can also identify here the execution unit where we essentially have the uh, arithmetic units to perform um, operations, and then we have the register group. In the register group, well, we can uh, go first for the execution unit. In the execution unit, you first see uh, this instruction. So this CRF sequencer, this CRF sequencer is like the control unit that can access these CRF registers where uh, the instructions are stored. Uh, remember that CRF means command register file. So this is a, essentially the instruction buffer uh, that stores up to 32 instructions of 32 bits. So the CRF sequencer, whenever it receives the corresponding signal, the corresponding command from the interface unit, fetches one new instruction from the CRF, sends it to the pipeline decoder. And here we have the, uh, say, first stage of the pipeline. After that, uh, we would go, we can either go optionally to the um, uh, external banks to, 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 to bring data from the banks, or we can uh, perform first a multiplication and then an addition, or simply just a multiplication or just an addition by using data coming from either the cell arrays or from the registers. And here in the register group, you can also see um, the general uh, register file that is partitioned in two parts, A and B, um, there are uh, in each of them eight entries of 256 bits. Remember that in a single access to the DRAM, uh, to the DRAM banks, we bring 256 
bits, and these 256 bits are the 16-bit uh, elements that the 16 uh, CIMD lanes of the CIMD unit need, right? And uh, here, uh, for example, in the mult array or the add array, you can see that these are composed by 16-bit floating point multiplier, 16-bit floating point other, and, and they are replicated 16 times because they are CIMD units. And I think I already mentioned this, but yeah, anyway, the last uh, part of the register group is the source register file where we store constants for the multiply and accumulate operations. Now let's take a look at the instruction set architecture is a reduced instruction set. It, 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 yes, it's just composed uh, uh, for, uh, by nine 32-bit uh, instructions because as you already know, this architecture is um, I mean, it's not a general purpose architecture, it's an architecture uh, focused on AI and machine learning. And there, um, let's say that the most uh, important and, and representative and useful instructions are addition, multiplication, multiply, accumulate, and multiply, add. And that's uh, what we uh, can uh, see here. And these uh, first four instructions are type floating point. These are the essentially arithmetic instructions, addition, multiplication, multiply, accumulate, and multiply, add. We also have uh, instructions to move data. Actually, we have this uh, move command to load or store data. And we also have this uh, field command uh, to copy data from the bank to the uh, general register file. And uh, uh, finally, we also have three uh, control path instructions. The first of them is do nothing is a knob instruction uh, that in, in case that you, you want to have like, several cycles that are, uh, let's say, empty and, and, the, and the, the, the execution units don't do anything useful. There is also a jump instruction that is going to be uh, important and necessary uh, to execute some uh, operations. In the end, remember from a previous slide that uh, we, only, we can only hold up to 32 instructions in the uh, CRF, in the um, command register file. Uh, so sometimes we will need to repeat this instruction several times to operate, for example, on all the elements of a vector to perform a, a dot product operation. So that's why it's going to be useful to, uh, this, this jump instruction is useful. And at the very end of um, each uh, sequence of commands, uh, we will have an exit instruction to indicate that the program came to an end. Uh, here you can see a little bit more detail about the instruction set architecture, about the different uh, operations or different instructions, addition, multiplication, addition, multiply, accumulate, multiply, add, and, um, and move, uh, the move instruction, where the operands may come, uh, both uh, source operands or input operands, source zero or source one, and also the destination uh, where it goes. As you see, the source operands may come either from the general register file, in some cases also from the um, a source register file, maybe a constant, or directly from the memory banks, as you uh, can see. And while the output always goes to the, uh, or the results always go uh, to the uh, general register file. But there are multiple combinations for these different instructions, as you can see, in order to uh, increase the functionality that the ISA provides. And about the instruction formats, as I mentioned before, they are 32-bit instructions. Um, first four bits or four more significant bits are for the opcode. Remember that we have nine different instructions, so uh, three bits wouldn't be enough. Um, we need uh, four bits to represent the opcode. Uh, and actually this gives uh, like, um, a slack of uh, several more opcodes in case that they want to include new instructions in the future. And you can identify uh, the rest of, uh, of the fields uh, in the instruction formats. Uh, those uh, denoted by U means that they are not used. Um, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, so here, for example, for control uh, op instructions, for example, a jump instruction, we can have here like um, immediate values, uh, like for example, to uh, define where we need to uh, jump in the, um, uh, data movement instructions. We also have like here uh, source and 
destination of the movement. We also have here an interesting B, this R bit um, indicates whether the move instruction performs uh, ReLU operation or not. Um, remember that uh, uh, ReLU is an operator that is used at the end of uh, some neural network layers. And, um, and, and, and it's quite interesting that the move instruction by itself uh, can perform this um, um, uh, ReLU operation. Um, and then uh, for ALUs, we also for arithmetic uh, instructions, we also uh, have yeah, like different uh, source operands, destination operands, and, and so on. And this, by the way, this bit A is for uh, the align mode that I will uh, mention briefly in, in a later slide. And, uh, and now something even more interesting that the format of the instructions themselves is how these instructions are executed, how um, the operation is controlled uh, from the host side, but, but also uh, from the uh, internals of the uh, HVM PIM uh, unit. So you can, um, in this particular example, we are assuming that we perform a, a matrix vector multiplication. Um, uh, keep in mind that the data might, might be coming from somewhere else. So input data might be coming, for example, from the network or from the storage. So at some point we I have to allow the CPU to access or the host processor to access um, DRAM in the uh, with the conventional operation, um, and that's uh, what happens here. So uh, when the um, let's say when the when we uh, uh, plug our HVM PIM system after power up and initialization, uh, we will have to ask ourselves whether we need. Uh, computing infinite DRAM or not. If not, it's just conventional DRAM operation, read and write um, data uh, from the cells, and, and then that's all. Or if we go to the FIM DRAM um, uh, operation, first of all, we'll be storing data into the cells. It's an input data for the operation that we want to perform, for example, a matrix vector multiplication. And then we would have to change the mode. Remember uh, from uh, several slides ago that uh, there are different modes of operation. There is a single bank mode, there is a conventional mode, and there is a, 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 a all bank uh, with PIM enable mode that is a FIN DRAM or PIM mode. So after storing input data into the cells, we have to uh, change the mode from the normal mode of operation to the processing in memory mode of operation. And then we have to load the program into the corresponding registers of the register file. Remember that these registers are the CRF, command register file. So uh, first thing that the host needs to do is writing the program into this CRF. Uh, this CRF is memory map, so for the CPU, this is just like a regular access where the CPU writes um, certain bytes, right? And these bytes or these bits are um, instructions. So these are going to be actually instructions and uh, weight data. And after that, we uh, enable and execute the FIM operation. As you see, the FIM uh, operation or the execution of FIM instructions is controlled uh, from outside, is controlled from the memory controller by um, sending DRAM commands to the um, HVM memory. And um, after each command, so here everything starts with an activate command, but after that, you see that the, um, uh, the, the um, PCU is going to receive, and then the, the, the memory side is going to receive uh, read and write commands. And every time that like, one of these commands is received, um, the sequencer goes to the CRF, fetches one new instruction uh, from the CRF and starts the execution of this instruction. And this happens up to 32 times consecutively um, because we have up to 32 instructions in the CRF. At some point, um, the 32 instructions will be um, executed. And um, so we exit the FIM operation. And um, eventually, uh, we may need to go to the beginning to load new instructions and then continue with the FIM or processing in memory execution after the FIM or PIM kernel 
uh, is completed, um, yeah, we terminate the execution, we go back uh, to the normal mode, and at this point, the CPU can access the data residing in the uh, memory cells uh, containing the results. So um, yeah, that's um, about the instruction or ordering. There is a, an important challenge here. Uh, observe from the previous slide that this execution of instructions is controlled by the memory controller in the host CPU that is sending read and write commands to the, um, to the PCUs essentially. And these read and write commands need to be sent in a specific order because these read and write commands contain for example, addresses of data that needs to be accessed from the cell arrays and brought to the registers and, uh, and, and being operated on. Um, so it's important that the sequence of commands happens um, in, the, in the right order, right? And that's actually challenging because DRAM commands are used to have their own internal schedulers that decide what's the next command to issue. And, um, and they essentially do this to um, you know, achieve higher bandwidth uh, of access to the, to the external, to the off-chip uh, DRAM memory. So this was really a challenge for, um, um, for um, Samsung folks, right? And one thing that they could have done is using fences, a fence um, ensures that, 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 so if you, if you place a fence between two DRAM commands, it's ensured that these two commands are not going to be reordered. Uh, but the problem with the fences is that they are very costly performance wise. So they came up with an interesting solution that is called address align mode. Recall bit A that I mentioned um, before when we were uh, taking a look at the format of the instructions. Uh, with this address align mode, uh, what they can do is executing eight MAC operations with just uh, two PIM instructions. And you can see the two PIM instructions here. It's a, a single, in this particular case, a single uh, MAC instruction using the address align mode and, uh, and this jump instruction that repeats this MAC operation up to eight times. So with, uh, so it's like essentially executing eight MAC operations with just uh, two PIM uh, instructions. You can yeah, check more details about this technique in the uh, paper. And then the data flow, how the data can be moved between um, you know, the processing elements or the PCUs and the memory banks. There are um, different modes of operation uh, in the data flow and um, they are, are based on the DRAM command that is uh, issued, either a read or a write, and also one special bit that is in row address uh, 13. So depending on the command and depending on the uh, on this um, uh, RA13 bit, um, uh, we, uh, we see different types of uh, data movement and actually different uh, types of data movement depending on whether we are using memory in the normal mode or in the FIM or PIM mode. So in the normal mode, uh, observe that the uh, bit RA13 13 is always low and, um, and then depending on the command, either read or write. So if it's a write, we write data to the cell array. If it's read, we read data from the cell array. This is the normal DRAM operation where the uh, host processor reads or writes data uh, from the uh, memory arrays. And in the uh, theme mode, there are uh, three different ways of moving data depending on uh, uh, the, the command as and the uh, bit RA13, as I said before. So if the bit RA13 is high, then this operation is a write, a data write to a PCU register. Like for example, um, this uh, can be useful when the uh, host, so actually the path, this is uh, index six. So the path is coming from here, as you see for this, um, uh, index six. So it's uh, like from, from outside, we can write something directly to the registers of the PC, like for example here, or for example here. So this is useful for what? This is useful to write, for example, commands or instructions to the CRF or to write operands to the register, to the general register file or to the source uh, register file. And then um, in the other two, um, 
uh, operation modes. Uh, we have um, uh, you, we have uh, this uh, RA13 is low, and we may have either read or write command. If it's a read command, it's um, it's index seven, as you see, is data movement from the bank from the cell array to the PCU block. We see the, uh, the this uh, arrow seven here or also here, and um, and the other case is the write. It's an index five is when we are writing something from the PCU block to the uh, DRAM back. So essentially what we need to, for the, for the PCU blocks to either read data from memory or write data to memory. And yeah, we are uh, almost done with the lecture and with the explanations about the uh, PIM DRAM architecture or HPMP architecture. Uh, don't hesitate to ask me um, any questions now or later you can, for example, send me an email and, and, and ask me any, any question. But yeah, here you can uh, see this is coming from one of the uh, papers from Samsung, a comparison table that um, yeah, compares the FIM DRAM architecture here in the rightmost column with other architectures starting from, let's say, basic uh, HVM memory with no compute capability to another um, proposal that has been tested in simulation and actually pretty interestingly to the AppMem PIM architecture. I don't think that they are directly comparable because in the end they are different from the beginning while the AppMem PIM architecture is general purpose and has a, a quite rich instruction set. FinDRAM has a very um, um, a small instruction set of just nine instructions because it has more application specific architecture targeted at uh, machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence. But yeah, it's, it's still it's uh, good to, I mean, it's interesting to, uh, to put together uh, all these uh, metrics and all these numbers here. The type of DRAM is different as you already know. Uh, AppMem PIM is based on DDR4 memory while FIM DRAM is based on HPM2 memory. Um, process is also different because they are also different different technologies regarding the memory density that's also different technologies in admin pin we have eight gigabytes per dim while in one cube of Fundira we have uh, up to six gigabytes um something yeah more interesting values here we have the um, uh, maximum bandwidth that we can obtain from uh, one dim this would be like the external bandwidth and actually you might remember um, uh, no, I, th I think we, we didn't cover that yet, but uh, we will uh, we will talk in a later lecture about these external bandwidth of the admin DIMMs, um, uh, maximum bandwidth or theoretical bandwidth of 19.2 gigabytes per second, which is actually the maximum bandwidth of one rank of, uh, of uh, DDR4 memory, while in FinDRAM we can obtain, we can achieve much higher external bandwidth of up to 307 uh, gigabytes per second. That's why uh, GPUs, for example, use uh, HPM memory because um, I mean it provides uh, much higher bandwidth than conventional uh, DDR memory. And and yeah, you can see uh, you know the number of channels um, per DIM uh, or uh, per cube, number of uh, processing elements. Uh, yeah, actually, I think this is. Uh, um, this 16 is the number of chips per DIMMs in, 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 in AppM. And this eight must be the number of DRAM layers uh, per cube, per HPM cube. Uh, the number of processing elements, 128 per DIMM, 128 per cube, and also different processing speeds. Actually, in the slide here, you see 500 megahertz for the AppM PIM system. If you remember from our previous lectures, we talk about either 425 megahertz or uh, 350 megahertz, but let's say it's more or less in the order of magnitude um, that we have here. And also you see some um, numbers for the peak throughput. That this is also not directly comparable essentially because these are, uh, let's say, integral operations while these are floating point operations. And uh, the operation precision in this case is, um, uh, I mean, they are considering int eight. I don't know the exact reason for that. 
because uh, Admem supports operation with 32-bit uh, integers as well. And actually it has some um, execution unit that are native 32-bit uh, adders, for example. Uh, but it's true that uh, the, the, the only uh, multiplication that is uh, natively supported in the current admin system is the 8-bit integer multiplication, while uh, uh, precision or the data type that Finduron uses, as you already know and we have mentioned before, is um, uh, floating point 16 bits. So this is essentially all for today. Here you have the um, reference uh, of the ISSCC 2021 paper, the first one that uh, Samsung presented about this architecture later, as I said before, this um, ISCA paper, and, uh, and, and, and a couple of months later, also the presentation at the Hot Chips Symposium. Um, HBMP, or commercially called Aquabolt XL, is not the only proposal from Samsung um, uh, as of today. They also uh, announced this Samsung AX team uh, system that is like a team-based system also with uh, very interesting characteristics and we will talk about it in a later lecture as well so uh, stay tuned and we will continue talking about other real world processing in memory architectures same as uh, other let's say aspects of uh, processing in memory system like how to program them or how to identify workload characteristics that make them suitable for processing in memory systems um, etc. There is uh, much more to come. So um, yeah, it would be uh, great to um, uh, yeah to uh, keep counting on you for these lectures. As I said before, um, please uh, ping me if you want to clarify anything related to the lecture or anything related to the uh, course. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And, um, and see you in our next lecture.